And now for announcements this week. We started the NECF 40-day fast and prayer journey yesterday. If you missed out yesterday's devotion, fret not, you can still join us today and for the next 38 days. The fast and prayer are on our website, ssgc.church. And don't forget to zoom into prayer meeting this coming Wednesday and we will be praying together for our country. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today, Brother Ramachandran. Brother Ramachandran was born and raised in Singapore and works with the Singapore Civil Service. He was converted from a Hindu background at a very young age and has been instrumental in bringing his family to the Lord. So now let's welcome Brother Ramachandran. I greet you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and it's indeed my privilege to share the Word of God with you this morning. COVID-19 has changed the entire landscape of this world and, uh, and, and your country as well as my country, we are going through many diff different changes and challenges as a result of this pandemic. But we believe that and we know that God is still on the throne and everything works for good to them that love the Lord. And although we are not able to meet face to face, we thank God for this technology that we can still be able to listen to God's word. And, and consider what are the things that God wants to speak to us. This morning, I want to share with you on the topic, Encountering God. Encountering God in such a way that our lives are touched and transformed for His kingdom and His glory. And I pray that as we listen to the word of God, God will touch us in a very special way that we will be challenged, motivated to do the work of evangelism and missions, that our churches will be a source of blessing to the nations and our community beyond us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you are doing in our lives. And we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And despite of all these challenges that we face, yet, Lord, you have been faithful and you have seen us through. And Lord, as we consider the encountering you in a very specific way, and we pray, Lord, as we listen to your word, you will speak to every one of us, Lord. Let your word transform our lives. Let your word speak to us that we will not be the same again. That we will, Lord, be people who will be transformed because we encountered you and our lives will be motivated to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to places and to people who have never heard about you. So, Lord, today as we listen, we pray you will speak to us in a very clear and a tangible way. And, Lord, give us the heart of obedience and listening ears to do what you want us to do. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are three important facts about missions and evangelism that every one of us need to know. First, while there are many functions in the church, evangelism and missions still remains the most important of them all. The Great Commission was the last statement Jesus gave to his disciples and to the church before he left this world. And there are many other things that Jesus could have said before he left this world, but he gave us the Great Commission. And this was his farewell message to his church, which was of very significance to him and to the church as well. Because this is going to set, set the pace for the church, change the landscape of the church, so that every member of the church will become a conduit of his blessing. The last commission should be our first concern. Yet, when we look around, it is the most neglected aspect of many churches. A simple analysis of any church budget will indicate how much of emphasis is given to missions and to evangelism. I know of many churches that spend a lot of money on infrastructure, on, on physical things, on salaries and many other things. But when it comes to evangelism and mission, that takes a very low priority. And that's a sad state of affairs in many of our churches. In 1974, a group of leading evangelists and Christians came together in Lausanne, Switzerland, and the purpose of their meeting was how we can continue the work of evangelism and how we can reach the entire world for the glory of God. And they came up with a statement that was known as the Lausanne Covenant. And the aim of this covenant, or the, or the main thesis of this covenant, was that God's intent is that evangelism requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Not just some missionaries with some of the gospel to some people. That was not the intent of God. 
that the whole church, everyone, you and I included, will take the whole gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world at large. And someone said that it is not that God has a mission for the church in the world, but rather God has a church in this world to carry out His mission and to the whole world. Secondly, evangelism is the only thing you and I will be doing in heaven. When we get to heaven, there will be worship and that is what we will be doing most of the time. I'm sure there will be Bible study. I'm sure there will be fellowship. But one thing will be lacking will be evangelism. There will be no opportunity for us to do evangelism. And if evangelism is to be done, it is to be done now and here on this world. And the third most important factor you and I must remember is that evangelism is every Christian's responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just the pastor or the leaders or, or people who are given the responsibility, but it is the duty and the obligation of every Christian to share the gospel. It is your responsibility and my responsibility. But sadly, the surveys indicate that about 90% of our church members hardly ever share the good news of Jesus Christ. And this man by the name of Curry R. Blake said this, If your gospel isn't touching others, it hasn't touched you. What a powerful statement. And it causes us to examine ourselves because Jesus said in Matthew 5.14, You are the light of the world. And he continued by saying in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. And the best thing we can do for the world is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, one of the intellectual giants of the 20th century and arguably one of the influential writers of his day, this is what he has to say about evangelism. He says the church exists for nothing else but to draw men to Christ, to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose but for this. And that's what the early church did after they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.42 tells us they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. And in Acts 5.42, and daily in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. And Acts 8.4 says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. You see, the early church, their priorities were very much different from what many of us have today. Their focus was always around the word of God. It was in prayer, it was in fellowship, and most importantly, being witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why was the early church so successful? I believe it's because they relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. They were all united in their efforts to do what God wanted them to do. And they were all witnesses. Every one of them witnessed for Christ. And their lives were exemplary. So much so when people saw them, they wanted to become Christians. But most importantly, every one of them recognized and realized it was their own personal obligation to be a witness and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And the question that you and I need to ask ourselves is, what am I doing about the Great Commission? How am I being involved in evangelism and missions? Yes, my church is being involved in missions and evangelism, but that's not the question. What is my role? What is my part as far as evangelism and missions is concerned? Paul Washer said this, Either you go down into the well with a rope to save others who are drowning or you hold the person who is going into the well with the rope. We all can play some important parts in the whole ministry of evangelism and missions. But the question is, what important role are you and I playing? What does the Great Commission cost you and me? 
Has there been some sacrifice of our time, our talents, our abilities? A serious question that you and I must consider and ask ourselves. Jesus commanded us in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He doesn't ask us to consider telling to others about Him when it's convenient. But as Christians, all of us are expected to share our faith to people that come around us. And if we ignore this command, the world around us, the people around us will miss the opportunity to know about the saving grace of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Let us look at the life of the Apostle Paul and the impact that the gospel had on him. And I want to turn to the book of Acts chapter 26 and I want to read two verses, verses 19 and 20. Acts 26, 19 and 20. It is like this. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus and to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to all the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. In the text that we just read and in the whole chapter of 26, Acts chapter 26, we read the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul was in Caesarea and many charges were framed against him by the Jewish people because of what he was doing. They charged him for uh, causing an, an uprising of going against the law, against the temple and spreading a false religion and even causing an uprising against the Roman emperor. And in the earlier chapters, if you will read, Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea and, and so that he could be tried by the authorities. But Actually, all these, all these uh, charges were, 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 were meaningless. Paul was innocent of all these charges. They were false charges, in fact. And when Paul saw that the, the, the leaders of the Jews were persistent, he appealed to go before Caesar and defend himself because he was a Roman citizen. And during the time, King Agrippa and his uh, queen sister, uh, Bernice, they were passing by to Caesarea. And when they heard that uh, Paul was there in prison and the governor Festus asked if they can listen to what Paul had to say. And that is why in the book of uh, Acts chapter 26, Paul was now making his defense before King Agrippa and his queen. You see, Paul was one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived. He's the most well-known figure in the New Testament. He wrote 14 epistles, much more than any other writer in the New Testament. He made five missionary trips during his lifetime to different parts of the region, every city in that and countries in that region, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unreached areas. Paul was also known for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. It was not heard of in, during that time. And Paul was instrumental in bringing the gospel to these unreached people. And he also had to train others to follow after him. Timothy, um, uh, John Mark, and, 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 and the rest of them. He trained many people to take on the mantle after him. His intense dedication and the calling to preach the gospel, however, came with a price. The Bible tells us he spent at least five total years in prison. He was whipped five times. He was beaten three times with a rod. And he was stoned and he faced shipwreck. And ultimately, he died as a martyr in the hands of the Romans. But the impact of Christ, but his life, the impact of his life to Christianity and the Christians was enormous, and it still impacts us today. If not for Paul, much of the New Testament would not have been in existence. He was truly a remarkable man used by God, a true servant of God, with a heart and a passion for evangelism. I always admired the Apostle Paul and, and, and despite of all that he went through, he was so fervent in his passion for evangelism. And I asked myself, why was Paul so passionate? Look at his passion in the following verses. Romans 1.15, Paul says, So as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And Rome is a place if Paul goes there, he knows he will be executed, but still he wants to go there to preach the gospel to those people. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Romans 15, 20, Paul says, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been known. You see his passion, you see his desires. He always wants to be a continual blessing, preaching the goodness of Jesus Christ. And everything Paul did was centered upon the gospel and taking the gospel to the unknown areas. And I ask myself this question, why does this man have so much of passion? Why was he able to achieve so much in his lifetime for the kingdom of God? While so many of us take life so easy and, and, and you know, our Christian life is so routine, why does this man have so much of passion for the gospel? And as I look at these two verses in Acts chapter 26, verses 19 to 20, I see three important reasons that change the life of this man. And I pray that as we look at these verses, your life and my life will be transformed and impacted as well. Firstly, Paul had an encounter with God. Acts 26, 19 says, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Paul, who was also known as Saul, was a devout Jew at that time and a Pharisee himself. He followed all the precepts of the law and to him the teachings of Jesus was something that was out of the, 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 the teachings of his law, the, the law that he knew. He thought it was heresy. And so he was bent on destroying Christians. And so he, he, he went to the, the leaders of the, the temple and asked them for, for permission and authority to go to Damascus and to pull all these Christians and put them into prison. So he makes his way to Damascus and on his way to Damascus, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, encountered him and that changed his life. And the moment Paul encountered Jesus on his way to Damascus, this is what happened to him. Acts 9, 20 to 24 says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on, the, on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by Provide, uh, pro proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this is the very man who persecuted all these Christians. He was responsible for the death of Stephen and many others. He, he threw them into prison. He was bent on destroying Christians because he thought that Jesus, the teachings of Jesus was a heresy. But the moment he had encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, he went around telling people, he went to the synagogues and told them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this is what happens to anyone who has a true encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the woman at the well in, of Samaria in John chapter 4? Now, this, is a, this was a woman with a terrible past. It was so bad that she did not even come to draw a well in the morning with the other ladies because everyone knew her reputation. She came alone in the afternoon, hoping that nobody will be there. But Jesus was there. And the moment she encountered Christ, the moment she knew who Jesus was and what he told her, she went to the city and brought the entire city to Jesus, telling them, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Now, this woman was not trained as an evangelist. She didn't even know how to do evangelism. All she did was told them, come and see this man. And she brought the entire city to the feet of Jesus. And the same thing happened to her 12 disciples. The Bible tells us in Mark 16, 20, the disciples went out, preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, confirmed his work by signs that accompanied it. And the same thing happened to the believers in the early church. Acts 8, 4 tells us, and those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Everywhere they went, they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, you and I need an encounter with God. If you want to get involved in missions, if you want to get actively involved in evangelism, in serious evangelism, you and I need a personal encounter with God. And the moment you encounter God, 
your life will never be the same. You will be like the poor, the early believers, the, like the, the early disciples going around and sharing the goodness of Jesus Christ with everyone who comes in contact with you and when God gives you the opportunity. I remember when I, I got saved at a very young age, my parents were still Hindus. But the moment after two years, my parents became Christians. They were going every one of our neighbors, every one of our relatives and telling them what Jesus could do for them. You see, my father had very terrible habits, but Christ delivered him from every kind of bondage. The moment he accepted Jesus Christ into his life, he was changed, transformed. The encounter transformed my entire family. And the first thing we did was to go from house to house, from neighbor to neighbor, from every relatives, and tell them Jesus Christ is the only way to God. That's what's happened to everyone who encountered Jesus Christ. And when you and I have a true encounter with Jesus, your life will never be the same. Yes, there were a lot of persecution, there were a lot of trials, people chased us away, but that did not stop us from sharing the goodness of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we knew Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life. And the message that we told them that their lives can be changed, Jesus can give them the peace, they can forgive, their sins can be forgiven and they can be assured of eternal life in the future. Today, many of my people in the community have come to know Jesus Christ as a result of my family. Why? Because we chose to go and tell them about Christ. Now, two things happen to anyone who has an encounter with Christ like Paul. The first thing that we will ask is just like what Paul asked, Who are you, Lord? You see, when you encounter God, you will want to see, you see the nature of God, His holiness. You see the, the, the sinfulness in ourselves and, and, we, and we see the compassion of God, His forgiveness. And that's exactly what happened to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter, chapter 6. He saw the presence of God. And the first thing he realized, that, Lord, woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips because he saw the holiness of God. And everyone who encounters God will see the holiness of God. And the next thing that a person who encounters God sees or, 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 or hears, you will hear his heartbeat. See, when Isaiah was in the presence of God, he heard the heartbeat of God. Who will go for us? Who will go and tell these people of their sins? And the same thing happened to Paul. Lord, what do you want me to do? You see, it's, it's beautiful and wonderful to be in the presence of God. We love to worship God with, with our hands lifted up in the other tongue and, and, and we love to worship God. But we come so close to the heart of God, but yet we fail to hear His heartbeat. You know, one of my friends by the name of Pastor Walson, he said this, the greatest tragedy in our churches today is that we come so close to the heart of God in worship and yet we fail to hear His heartbeat. You know, we come to the presence of God, we lift our hands up, we sing, we jump, we shout. All this is wonderful. But has that led us to hear God's heartbeat? Because if we are able to hear His heartbeat, it will be always for evangelism and missions. The question is, have we heard the heartbeat of God? You know, as I search through the Bible, as I read the many passages in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, I can't find one verse that says, Heaven rejoice when the church of God worship together on the earth. But there's one verse that says, The angels rejoice in heaven when one sinner repented from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You know what causes joy in heaven? The salvation of souls. Heaven desires this. And the question is, have you and I heard the heartbeat of God? And Paul asked the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you want me to do? And the answer was given, arise, go to the city, I need to be told to you. And, and the Lord revealed to him the nature of the stars that he will take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the kings, to the people of Israel. And God also told him the kind of things that he must suffer for the sake of the gospel. And Paul went on to accomplish all these things for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. Hallelujah. And so did Moses, so did Jacob, and so did Peter, Isaiah, Jeremiah, everyone in the Bible, everyone who encountered God. They went on to accomplish great and mighty exploits for the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, you and I can do the same thing 
for God. You and I can be changed. You and I can be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we encounter Christ in a very special way, our lives can touch the lives of many people for His glory. And when you and I encounter God, the same question we will ask God, what do you want me to do? And the answer will be very obvious. Go make disciples of all nations. Have we heard that call from God? Have we had that kind of encounter, that the same kind of encounter that Paul had, that the early church had? Because that will transform us for missions and evangelism. Paul had an encounter with God. And secondly, Paul had an encounter with the world. Acts 26, 19 and 20. So then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Jerusalem and to those in First to those in Damascus and to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to all the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God. You see, Paul was obedient to the vision that God had given to him. It was a powerful vision. It was a huge vision. God seldom gives us a small vision. But the issue is, the question is, are we listening to God? Are we waiting in His presence to receive the vision that God wants to give it to us? Paul reached his world at that time and his vision is still reaching the world today. Paul probably planted about 20 churches in his lifetime. In the short lifetime, 14 years of ministry, Paul planted more than 20 churches. But when Paul left the scene, he left a DNA, a movement that eventually will reach thousands and millions and billions of people for the glory of God. I'm sure God can do the same thing with your life and my life. If we have ever had an encounter with God and just like Paul, you and I also will want to encounter this world. I remember the time when I encountered the Lord. It was in, in, in the Haggai Institute in Maui in the year 2006. I was attending the leadership seminar in those days. I was impacted by what I heard. I was impacted by the Great Commission. I was impacted by the biblical mandate. And I was impacted by the need to take the gospel, the extent of the gospel poverty. And I realized that it was my responsibility. And I began to spend time in the presence of God in prayer and asking God, give me a vision just like the vision that you gave to your servants. I want to know what I need to do to, to end this gospel, gospel poverty that is within my reach. And God gave me a clear plan as to what to do. So I started evangelism teams and I got together with people, with partners. And we started evangelism team that would take the gospel of Jesus Christ to unriched villages in India. We started a, a church planting movement. We began to change, uh, train church planters. And then we began to move from one village to another, from one district to another. And soon God began to open doors to go into different states. And then we began to see people coming to Christ. We began to see villages coming to Christ. Thousands of people coming to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Lord began to lead us into other countries. And, 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 and the work just began to grow. And we began to see churches growing in different, different parts of India. It was hard work. It was costly. And just like Paul, there were many challenges. There were times we were chased away. There were times we, were, we almost lost our lives. But God was with us in every part of the journey. And today we have planted more than 6,000 churches. We have trained more than 1,000 church planters. And the work of God is still carrying on. In spite of the fact that COVID-19 is raging throughout the world, the work of God is still going. People are getting saved. Churches are being planted. And many social work is being done for the glory of God. How was this possible? Because when I encountered God, I also wanted to encounter this world. And I cried before God and asked the Lord to give me a clear direction and a clear vision. Lord, I just don't want to be in my comfort zone. I just don't want my life to be a, just a routine Christian. But I want to do what you want me to do. And just like Paul, I want to impact this world for your glory. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are serious with your life, if you are serious with your work and your relationship with Jesus Christ, then you will want to also ask the same question that Paul said. Ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when you are serious about this call, and when you spend time in prayer and asking God, God will give you a clear revelation as to the extent of what God wants you to do. 
And God will lead you to, to do evangelism. God will lead, He will fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit and take you to regions beyond. And through your life, many people will be impacted. And today we are working in five different countries, in 12 different states in India, and, and many churches are being planted, and the work of God is still continuing, despite of all the challenges. Why? Because we want to end gospel poverty as fast, as far as we can. Brothers and sisters, this is only possible if you and I have that desire in our hearts. You want to say to God, Lord, I am not, I'm, I am not happy, I don't want to be the routine Christian. I'm not happy with the status quo. I want my life to be changed. And when you realize that this is the only thing that can reconcile a person back to God, the gospel is the only thing that can change the life of people. Because Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You and I know this for a fact. And if you are truly convinced that Jesus is the only way, then you and I will want to take this gospel to the places and to the people who have never heard about him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Why? So that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And how can they listen if you and I will not take the gospel and bring this news, this good news to them? We know that this world, there are only about 30% Christians and the vast population of this world are yet to be challenged by the claims of Jesus Christ. They can be your family members, they can be your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors, your relatives, and those within your community, many of them who have never heard or who have heard and still have not made a decision for Jesus Christ. The responsibility lies with you and for me. And this message is so urgent. Look at all the things that are happening around us. Everything points to the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you and I really don't have time. And if you and I want to take the Great Commission seriously, then you and I must have an encounter with God. You and I must have an encounter with this world. See the nature of, or, or look at the extent of this world that has not been impacted with the gospel. And things are not getting easier. There's so much of restrictions, so much of uh, changes in the worldview, and, and, and the devil is doing all he can to stop people from becoming Christians. But don't forget, our God is greater than the enemy, the devil. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can reach our neighbors, we can reach our community. Despite of all the restrictions, the government and the people around us can put against us. And if you and I believe that Christ is coming, and coming very soon, then you and I must do all that we can to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had an encounter with God. Paul had an encounter with the world. And thirdly, Paul had an encounter with himself. Paul says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. See, Paul didn't say, I asked Timothy, I asked Barabbas or the rest of them to go and preach. No, I preached the gospel. I went on the journey. I took the step of going to the different places. I took the step of, 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 of going to all those villages and all those cities and preach the gospel in the synagogues and everywhere the Lord gave opportunity. That's what Paul was saying. He himself went and did the work of the gospel. It is no more preaching from a distance or sharing the, uh, or preaching in the church, but going out and reaching the unreached people. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples. What we do today is we say, come, come to the church. But the command given to us was go out into the streets and preach the gospel. That's why when Jesus on the face of this earth, he, was, he had a name that was called the friend of sinners. Why? He was seen being with the outcasts of society, the, the, the prostitutes, the publicans, and those people who were outcasts of society, he was there preaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul realized that it was his responsibility and that is why he encountered himself. I preach the gospel that people should repent and turn to the true living God. And you and I know the extent to which Paul went. 
He suffered so many sufferings. He was, he almost died at one point in time. Shipwreck after shipwreck and suffering after suffering. Yet he never gave up the focus and the hope and the calling that was placed upon his life. Why did Paul do that? Because he knew it was an order given to him. It was the mandate given by God to him. And it's the same mandate that is given to every one of us Christians. All of us are, are commanded to go and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew 20 and 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded to us. It is not just for a few people, but for every one of us Christians. And if you truly love the Lord, then just like Paul, you and I will take this as a challenge to us because it's an order that God has given to us. And Paul knew that it was his personal obligation to preach the gospel. Not somebody else, not delegated to somebody else, but it is my responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And then in Romans 1, 14 to 16, Paul says, I am obligated both to the Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and to the Gentiles. You see, Paul was not ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone, whether you're a Greek or a non-Greek. He was not ashamed. And God will bring people across your path in my life. God will bring opportunities across our journey. The question is, are you and I willing to take the opportunity that God brings? to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Friends, you and I have a great responsibility. You and I know that we really don't have time. And you and I know that people without Christ, they will be lost for eternity if we do not do the task that Christ has given to us. And Paul knew what he was called to do. And Paul knew that it was his responsibility. And he knew that God has commanded him to go and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unreached people. Maybe some of us who are listening to the sound of my voice may be saying to ourselves, look, in my whole life I've never shared the gospel with anybody. But the good news is, when you and I encounter God, when you and I encounter the world and you and I encounter ourselves and recognize that this is my responsibility, and when we ask the Holy Spirit, He will fill us with the power and He will give us the power to be witnesses for His name. You see, that's a, that was the very main purpose the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Spirit was given not for us to sing and shout and jump. Yes, all that is good. But the main purpose the Holy Spirit was given that you and I will be empowered to be witnesses for His name. In Jerusalem, in, in, in Judea, in Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the world. That's what X1 says. But there must come a time in my life you and I encounter God. You and I see the importance of the Great Commission. You and I see the task that is ahead of us. And you and I see the, the, the love that God has shed upon this world. That He wants everyone to come to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You know, an old Chinese proverb says like this. When is the best time to plant a tree? The answer is 25 years ago, you should have planted the tree. The next question is, when is the second best time to plant the tree? The answer is right now. Yes, you and I should have done the task of evangelism many years ago when we got saved. But somehow along the line, we became busy, we became carried away by the things of this world, we became Liu Kong. But today the Lord is speaking to us again in a very specific and in a very powerful way. What will you do with the Great Commission? When will be the best time to start again? It is going to be right now. You and I must decide. Lord, from today onwards, every opportunity that comes across my way, Lord, I will make full use of it. And I want to be a witness for your name. And Lord, give me a clear direction, a clear vision, exactly what you want me to do. When I leave this world, I want to leave a legacy behind that the name of Jesus Christ will be glorified and uplifted. Paul had an encounter with God, 
Paul had an encounter with the world and Paul had an encounter with himself. And that changed not only his life, but the destiny of the, 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 the course of the world was changed. Because through the life of this one man, even today, millions of people are coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through the words that he has written. Of course, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that does the convicting. But this man has done something for the kingdom of God. And the question is, what have you done? What have I done for God's kingdom? Jesus gave us the mandate. Jesus gave us the commission. And Jesus gave us his life. And we are all, we all uh, uh, blessed to be saved by His grace. We are blessed to be partakers of the love of Christ. We know that our future is secured. And now it's time that you and I take responsibility for the Great Commission. You and I realize that it's my responsibility to go out there and do the work of evangelism. The harvest is plentiful. That's what Jesus said. The harvest is really plentiful. There are people who are just waiting to hear the word of God. The question is, will you take this as your own responsibility? Or will I take this as my responsibility? And together, we will go out there and do the work what God wants us to do. When you and I do that, then our Christian life is productive, profitable, meaningful, and we will do something wonderful for the kingdom of God. Isaiah 6, 8, when, the, the, when Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord, who will send, who, whom shall be sent, who will go for us? Isaiah responded and said, here am I, Lord, send me. Lord, I am willing to go. Send me, use me. I pray that will be your response and my response even today as far as the Great Commission is concerned. God, use me, send me, empower me and help me out to go out there and Lord, end gospel poverty as much as I can in my lifetime. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your word. Lord, just as Paul encountered you and encountered the world and himself, Lord, we want to encounter you, Lord. Our lives need an encounter from you that, Lord, the importance and the impact of the Great Commission, Lord, will overtake us. The passion will drive us, Lord, to become your witnesses, to become people who will take the gospel to regions that have never heard about you. So I pray, Lord, you will transform everyone who has heard the message today. Everyone, Lord, who has been, who has been listening to this message, you will touch their lives, Lord. You will change their lives. You will impact them with the need, the passion, and the desire to go out there and do the work. It's enough, Lord, that you have sat in our churches for too long. It's enough, Lord, for, for being lukewarm and being so comfortable in where we are. Let us rise up. Go out there and do the work that you want us to do. The name of Jesus Christ will be heard in every corner of this earth for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ramachandran, for sharing the timely message with us. Now, if you're new, have a prayer request or a testimony to share, we would love to connect and hear from you. Kindly scan the QR code on the screen or click the link below and we look forward in hearing from you you. And friends, I trust that you've been blessed, encouraged and challenged by the Lord in this morning's service. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has been so powerfully spoken to us. And I pray that you will help us uh, yearn and hunger more for your word as your truth grows deeper and deeper in our hearts. And Father, I pray that your grace and favour be upon all our families, our relationships, our work and our life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Till we meet again, God bless.